نشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشده ومن يعصهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفكر قولي اللهم ألنا الحق حقا وزبنا الطباء وألنا الباطل باطلا وزبنا اجتنابا آمين يا رب Today, I want to talk about your legacy as a family. You see, we live in a situation where we do not know the unseen, as you know. We do not know the reality of what will be the situation of our families a hundred years from now. And I have said this, and I don't think I can say this enough times because of the social impact of this. That the first generation that comes loses the language. And the second generation loses the culture. And sociologically speaking, the third generation would inevitably lose the religion. So this is the situation, this is what we're up against. This is the challenge. And while this is the challenge, no one in this room can guarantee that a hundred years from now my children will be Muslim. No one can. No one can guarantee that my grandchildren's grandchildren will be upholding the teachings of Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Muhammad In addition to that, we live in a time, and over here I'd like to mention something interesting since I'm mentioning time. We live in a time where time seems to be moving faster and faster. We have less and less time. Every year seems to pass more quickly than the previous years before. And so we have less time for family. We have less time to be a father. We have less time to be a husband. We have less time in our hand overall. And the other situation that we have in the Muslim community, the biggest, I'll come to this point, but let me now go to Prophet Ibrahim Why we say in our prayers, I'll explain this today so that you understand this and how it relates to my talk today. Why we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim you know the Bible says by the way that God blesses those who bless Abraham Allah blesses those who bless Ibrahim and as you know in our prayers every prayer we pray five times a day we bless Prophet Ibrahim when we say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim why do we do that? Why do we bless or remember Ibrahim Why do we remember the legacy of Prophet Ibrahim? We remember his legacy because he, you know, let me put it to you this way that 
he was there himself. Then his children, Ismail and Ishaq, okay? And then the grandchildren, they all, this is a very big blessing for someone. That my son is on my path, my grandchildren are also on my path. That when you come before Allah on the Day of Judgment, when you come before Allah, that you can show Allah that not only was I believing in you and I completing my commandments that you wanted me to complete, but also my son, not only my son, but also my grandchildren. And this is what Ibrahim والسلام, did when it says, What is Yarfaw Ibrahim Qawaida min al Bayti wa Ismail? And remember the time where Ibrahim and Ismail were making the Kaaba. You know they were making the Kaaba. Yarfaw Qawaida min al Bayti Ismail. Rabbana taqabbal minna in the dua goes on. But the point is, here's Ibrahim with his son building the house of God. The house of God. Where the community is now going to come, but him himself. Now Prophet Muhammad also wanted this for himself. That not only am I, I'm just one, one generation, but not only am I worshipping Allah, but my children, Hassan and Hussein for example, but my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, that they also will be on the same path that I'm upon. What can you do as a family? What can you do as a father, as a husband, as a spouse to make sure that your legacy will still be alive a hundred years from now? What can you do? This is the question that I wanted to talk about. But I also wanted to talk about two topics that relate to this because everything has a spiritual aspect. You know, there is an outside aspect, an external aspect of things, and then there is, you can say, a bottom aspect of things, an internal aspect of things. I want to start by saying, there is no bigger reality of life than death. Even an atheist can't deny death. Everyone has to die. Everyone's destination is the grave. And a bigger reality than death. There is a bigger reality than death because the Quran uses the word yaqeen for this. Wahum bil akhirati hum yuqinun. Yaqeen. Certainty. A bigger reality than death. But you know there's a curtain on it. There's a curtain on that reality. And that is that you will be brought before Allah, you will be brought before God, and you have to answer Him about everything that you did in this life. Death is the reality, a bigger, the biggest reality of this life. And the hereafter is a bigger reality, but there's a curtain on it. And regarding this, you know, I'm talking about the legacy that every parent has. How can we create that legacy that a hundred years from now, your legacy is flourishing, your legacy of Islam is flourishing? We in fiqh, in Islamic law, we know that we have the rules of inheritance. How much the daughters will get, how much the sons will get, how much the wife will get, how much the grandparents if they're alive, so on and so forth. All of this is in Surah Al-Ma'idah in the first four verses, the laws of inheritance are there. But there's another aspect of wasiya, which nowadays as a tradition we have forgotten. And that is the wasiya, the written, the written wasiya as an advice, a parting advice, like al-wida, al-wida'i, a written advice to your children that of course they're gonna get your inheritance, but along with the inheritance is like a letter. We have in the Islamic tradition many famous wasaya of many of the great scholars like Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jalani, Ali, Ali radiallahu an example. Ali radiallahu an, he wrote a very long letter for his children, not only Hassan and Hussein, because he had Hassan and Hussein until Fatima was alive, but after Fatima passed away, radiallahu anha, Ali radiallahu an, radiallahu an, he got married again. He had more children. 
So he wrote a very long letter to his children that this is my parting advice to you. Whatever that was, it's a long letter, I can't go over that in this session. So I advise you, you know when the Prophet ﷺ said that a believer should not pass three days except he should have his wasiyah with him. He should have his his uh, papers of his inheritance with him because you can die any time. That shouldn't only include the numerical aspects. Okay, he will get this much and she will get this much. But also parting advice, spiritual advice. Maybe when, you know, you know the people in your family and what their weaknesses are, or what their hopes are, or what their interests are, or what their needs are. You want to give that parting advice before you pass away. So this is one thing uh, that is very, very important. That you have something written. Even if you have no money, you know, you can still write a parting advice. So regarding this, the Quran mentions, <coughs> This is the parting advice of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. He said, and Allah says, وَوَصَّى بِهَا Ibrahim." Banihi wa Ya'qub. Ibrahim gave parting advice, parting wasaya, wasiya. It can also be translated as commandments, you can say, but it's parting advice really. He said, Ya Baniya, oh my children. And you know, not only his sons were there, but his grandchildren, Ya'qub was, his grandchild Ya'qub was there. Ya Baniya, inna Allah astafa lakum Oh my children, Allah has chosen a way of life for you. فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Do not die except you have completely surrendered to God for those values and those ideas, the social, you can say, the social norms Islam wants to promote within a society. Don't die except you have surrendered to God. Then Allah says, now Allah comes to the grandson, grandson also. And you were not there, O Prophet Muhammad when Yaqub was at his moment of his death and he said, Now Yaqub is saying to his children, Oh my children, who will you worship after me? They said, Yaqub is Jacob in English. So they said to uh, uh, Jacob, We will worship your God. And the God of Abraham. And the God of Ismail. And Ishaq. And the God of Jacob. Ilaha wahida, the one true God, wa nahnu lahu muslimun, and we surrender to him completely. Then God says, Tilka ummatun qad khalat, laha ma kasabat, wa lakum ma kasabtum. This is a nation, a people that are now gone. You are here. They will get what they have earned. You will get what you will earn. The point here is, can you imagine what you are if you are sincere in your wanting a legacy, like Ibrahim wanted a legacy, right? He wanted a legacy, he built, he built a community, he built the masjid, he built the Kaaba with his son. So there is something, some center, some centerpiece. And then the families, they come together and Ibrahim then is giving wasiyah at the end to his son. Why? So he can keep that continuity of that legacy to continue. What can we do today that despite all the difficulties that we can have the opportunity 
to build a legacy for our children and our great-grandchildren. So regarding that, I wanted to make a few comments. Number one, every Muslim family <clears throat> should have Islamic books in their house. Your kids should grow up seeing, oh, these are the books of Islam. Not just any good book also, but specifically books of Islam. Books that tell them, especially in this time when there is so much stereotypes against Islam and against Muslims, that if the parents are not doing diligent work, they may start believing what they hear in the media. And so it is very important that as children grow up, they see books around them. Even if they don't read them, they, but the fact that you have books is symbolic of what you represent. It's symbolically representative of your ideas and your values and your culture. So it's very important that every parent, when he grows up, he has a special place where there is Muslim, Islamic books. In fact, inshallah, we will be building a library here, a small one. And we will create even, we'll do more things than that, inshallah, but we will be doing that. But it's very important children grow up seeing that and it's important that children grow up seeing their parents read these books from time to time so that they know that these are valuable to our parents. It's very important for children. You know, uh, I have said this before, but again, I can't emphasize the importance of this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, when Allah created Adam, the first thing Allah says, Ya Adam, uskun anta wa zawjuka janna wa kula minha ragadan haythu shi'tuma. Oh Adam, you and your wife live in Jannah. And do what? Do what in Jannah? Do what in paradise? Wa kula minha ragadan haythu shi'tuma. And eat from Jannah as much as you like. Why? Why Allah tells Adam that you eat with your wife? Because eating is not just a biological phenomenon. It's a social phenomenon. Eating is a way of bringing people together. Eating is a time where your defense mechanisms fall. This is why people that do big businesses go out and eat so that they can make the other person relaxed and talk heart to heart, so to say, and bring down their defense mechanisms. It's very important that when you come home, you eat together as a family. If not every day, at least a few times a week, if not a few, you know, as much as you can, the more you can, the better. And specifically, I'm talking about eating together because breaking bread together brings the hearts together. So Allah said, Ya Adam, O Adam, uskun anta wa zawjuka jannah You and your wife live in paradise and do what? Wa kula minha raladan haythu shi'tuma And eat to your delight as much as you like from wherever you like. thing I said, every Muslim should think about what will be my wasiya, what advice will I write to my children when it's my time to part. Second, have Islamic books in your house. Number two, uh, number three, eat together as a family as much as possible. Number four, you have to make sure that you are involved in the Muslim community. Let me express this to you in this way. Ibrahim made the Kaaba. Why? Why he made the Kaaba? Why he made the Kaaba? The Masjid. Why he made the Masjid? You know, when you read the Quran, when you find Aqimul Salah wa Atul Zakat, over here, one thing I want to mention, very interesting, I think you'll enjoy this parable. <clears throat> and this has to do with the fact that I'm talking about time is going faster and faster. 
And in fact, Prophet Muhammad said before the Day of Judgment, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment would be that time would go faster and faster. So, this is a parable. This is not true. I'm giving an example from this parable. There was a man. He didn't have a job, so he goes to someone. Someone gives him a job as a woodcutter. So he's cutting wood. And so the first day he cuts 20 trees. And the owner, the, the boss was very happy. You cut 20 trees, this is great. The second day he cuts 18 trees. And the next day he cuts 16 trees. So his, the number of trees he's trying to cut is going down instead of getting used to it. So he goes to his owner and says, you know what, I've been working harder and harder and I cut, I seem to cut less and less trees. And then the boss asked him, did you sharpen your axe? Did you sharpen your axe? Maybe that's the reason you're not able to cut down the number of trees you started with. This is the example of dhikr and salah. It seems like when you're praying, you're wasting time. It may seem like astaghfirullah that when you are involved in salah, you know, the five minutes, ten minutes it takes, you're wasting time. But in fact, when you are remembering Allah, when you're reading Quran, when you're doing salah, it is like you're sharpening the edge of the axe. And I can prove this from Quran and Sunnah, but I don't have time right now for this. Because there is barakah in the salawat that we do. There is barakah in the du'as that we do. There is barakah in the Quran that we read. And in fact, sometimes slowing ourselves down is the best thing to do to actually move faster forward sometimes. So, some, you know, we live in this world of instant gratification, instant gratification. And I've all shared with you many times now, I think the marshmallow experiment on this. But the point is, is that, you know, even Allah says in the Quran, You love the here and the now. You're so lost in the here and the now. But you forget for what is going to come. You forget about the hereafter. You forget about what's going to be next. And there's a, there's a, there's a lot of interesting books on this very concept of, we want instant grant, and this is one of, there are two things that I want to emphasize, because there's so much to say on this topic. Out of all the crises that have happened in the Muslim Ummah, At the social level, not at the political level, not at the economic level, at the social level. Because in the Muslim world, what is still intact, what is still intact for the Muslims is still our social norms. The way our families function, our social norms are still intact. But even within our social system, within the social tradition of Islam and within the social tradition of Muslims, what the crisis, the biggest crisis in the modern times within the social system has been the crisis of adab, the crisis of losing the proper etiquettes and manners. <coughs> it is true that what Imam Ibn Taymiyyah said is true, that do not raise your kids the way you were raised because Allah raised them for a different generation. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah has written, do not raise your kids like you were raised. And when you young guys, when you grow up, you'll see you'll default to the same way of treating your kids the way your parents treated you. It just happens naturally because that's what you know. And so Imam Nitaimi on the one side says, do not raise your kids the way your parents raised you because Allah has made them for a different generation. But on the other hand, there's no doubt that this generation, the generation that, that is after me and even my generation and after, we have had a crisis of adab, a crisis of manners. We have lost our traditions of knowing how to treat a guest. You know, when we go to somebody's house, and this is another thing very important, by the way, give your children chores to do. They sh a child that's in second grade and above should have chores to do in the house. Inshallah, I'll continue in my second khutbah.
ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب I can see that time has run out for me so I just want to summarize what I have said so far Number 1 <coughs> create a legacy for yourself like Ibrahim created a legacy for himself that he can stand before Allah and say Allah look I am before you my child is before you even my grandchild is before you and this was even what prophet Muhammad wanted for himself This is one of the one of the reasons why the Mahdi is so important, because Mahdi will be one person from the family of the Prophet who will witness certain things on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he will be just a normal, you know, commander in chief. So number one, number two, create wasaya. Think about what you want what you want to leave written for your children as a last advice, parting advice for your children. before you leave this world. Number 2, have Islamic books in your house and read them before your kids so that they grow up seeing, "Oh, my parents value this." Come to the masjid often so that your parent, your children understand that this is something important. If you, you know, if Ibrahim was soft, if Ibrahim was flexible, if Ibrahim was mediocre in his commitment Then imagine what would have happened three generations later. The more commitment you show, you can only expect a little bit less than that from the people that will follow. So be involved in the community masjid. Eat with your family every day and then talk. You know you're not truly in connection with your families until everybody you know you know when you know you know when things are not good is when you ask your children questions and they give you one word answers how was your day good what did you do nothing then you know you because look at yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam he's a prophet joseph he goes and tells his dream to his 100 year old father old man but he wants to tell him even a dream that he had he wants to, you know you have a strong relationship when people are swapping stories oh yeah what happened with you oh just like you do with friends just like you do when you're friends swapping story what else do you do changing exchanging emotions and stories and events so have islamic books be involved in the masajid if you're not involved in the masajid How can you expect 100 years from now your legacy will be coming to the masjids? If you don't have Islamic books, how are they going to have value for knowledge and then see that you honored? This is what it's so important that Muslim families have like a small library if they can afford it, have a small library of Islamic books on all sorts of topics, tafsir, sirah, sunnah, so on and so forth. eat together i've talked about this many times eating together brings the families together and uh, again time has run out so let's pray inshallah and then we will pray rabbana zalamna anfusana oh i wanted to mention uh, something important two important things i don't know if we were able to do that if we're not able to do it this juma that's fine i have is small i should i don't know if i do or not but i have Actually, we'll do that next Jumaat. I want. I, we're going to inshallah create a small business directory for the Muslim businesses in this area. So those of you that have businesses, keep this in mind that we do want to do this. But the other thing is, those of you that are from Chad or from uh, Indonesia or from any of the other parts of the Muslim world, and you want to teach your children in your own language or you want to have halakas with your friends in your own language. with your own ethnic background no problem just make sure you communicate between me and the leadership dr rehan and we don't have any problem with anybody 
coming here and teaching their children in their own language. So I know that sometimes Indonesian brothers, they come here. Sometimes brother from Chad come here. Some people from West Africa come here. They all speak different languages. And they're open and they're welcome to come here and start their halakas, you know, and, and, and uh, create their own halakas over here. It just needs to be done with a certain protocol and there's no other issues other than that. So let's inshallah finish with dua. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our spouses and our children an apple of our eye ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما and make us the role models and leaders of pious people O oh Allah forgive us Rabbana, Rabbana, fill lana wa hamna. O Allah, have mercy on us. Allahumma fill lana wa hamna. Anta maulana. Fansunna ala al-qawmi kafirin. Allahumma amin ya Rabb. I just want to mention one thing and then we'll pray. The Islamic concept of entertainment. Entertainment in Islam is spending time with your family. I wish I had time right now to talk about what is happiness. You never find happiness pursuing happiness. You find happiness as a result of doing things, other things, that you're supposed to do in life. When you fulfill your responsibilities in life, and you're contented upon your destiny Allah has written for you. If you're poor, you're poor. If you're rich, you're rich. You're happy with what Allah has written for you, and you fulfill your responsibilities in this life, then happiness will come to you. Happiness will not, you can't buy happiness, per se. You can buy happiness if you give sadaqa. In that way, yes. but. In, in, in the other worldly way you can't. But anyway, uh, Islamic concept of happiness is your children, your spouse, your house is in harmony, the environment is what you want it to be, the emotions are harmonious, you know how to resolve conflicts in your house. This is a very big issue. How do you, okay, so there's a conflict. One way to deal with it is don't talk about it. The other is, okay, our emotions are mature enough to deal with it. We can talk about it. Let's deal with it. Anyway, these are other issues that we will be talking about later on. Inna Allah ya'amurukum bil adli wal ihsan wa ita izul qurba wa yinha'an al fahshai wal munkari wal baghi. Ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkarun. Uzkurullah yaskurkum fastajib lakum fa'aqimu salat.